So I have the pleasure of introducing, very briefly, there's more to say about each of them, uh, but I'll keep the introductions brief and get to them. Uh, so tonight, Humanities New York is delighted to host Claudia Rankine, Sarah Blake, and our own Diva Woodley. Claudia Rankine is the Frederick Eisenman Professor of Poetry at Yale University and the author of numerous works, including The White Card, A Play, and Citizen, an American Lyric. She's also a winner <coughs> of the MacArthur Prize. Sarah Blake is a poet and novelist. Her many books include The Guest House, The Postmistress, and Grange House. Diva Woodley is Associate Professor of Politics at the New School and a member of Humanities New York's Board of Directors. She is the author of The Politics of Common Sense, How Social Movements Use Public Discourse to Change Politics and Win Acceptance. Thank you. Okay, so hello. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I think we're going to be in for a delightful conversation that hopefully will cause us all to um, renew our thinking uh, in various kinds of ways. So I just wanted to frame a, a few minutes um, this sort of conversation that we're having tonight about race, history, uh, and imagination, the American imagination. Um, and then I will pass it over to um, uh, Claudia Rankin and Sarah Blake to read uh, from their works. And then we'll have a question and answer uh, section so that um, everyone can kind of engage in the richness of their work uh, and also hopefully in the sort of framework of questions that I, that I, that I want to sort of ask. Um, okay, so Ralph Ellison said, power for the writer, it seems to me, lies in his ability to reveal, if only a little bit more, about the complexity of humanity. And in this country, I think it's very, very important for the writer to, no matter what the agony of his experience, he should stick to what he's doing, because the slightest thing that is new, or the slightest thing that has been overlooked, which would tell us about the unity of American experience, are very, very important. And when a writer fails to contribute to this, then he's played his art false, and he probably does violence to our political vision of ourselves. That's Ellison, 1966. But I don't know, here's my question, one I want to share with you. I don't know that there is a unity to the American experience. Every measure of American opinion, for example, remember I'm a social scientist, so I'm going to bring the public opinion to you. Every measure of American opinion shows a stark divide between black and white and people of color and, and non-white people, um, though that has been changing slightly in the last couple of years. Instead, it seems we are, as um, Sarah Blake puts it in a scene in her book, the guest book, familiar strangers. We expect to see each other on the street. We expect to see each other at work, but not in the same neighborhood or building not in the same church, not in the same schools. But we come into our subjectivities in profoundly different ways. And it's not the neutral difference of diversity, it is the harmful difference of asymmetrical power, power that shapes life chances. And so history, memory, race, and even imagination may mean wildly different things to us. So I put the question to each of you and to our authors on the stage. What history are we talking about when we are talking about American history? Is it of a piece? What does it mean for a writer to tell an American story? What must be included? What must be explored? Put differently, how do we write a reckoning? Good evening. It's um, an honor to be here with my old friend, Sarah Blake, and my new friend. <laughs> um, I, it occurred to me that I could have read from the white card because that's what you are receiving. But could have, should have, would have. <laughs> Instead, I'm, I'm going to read the final piece in a new work that will be published next year. My friend says the gravitational force of an origin story is difficult to get over. I am thinking of white supremacy. How many narratives are there 
for black people in the white imaginary. The theorist Barbara Johnson suggested whatever narratives exist are already read. I would add that in the end, all the narratives end up naming blacks with words that begin with the letter N. Nurse could be one. Nanny, another. No one could be yet another. We're not helpless, but we are conditioned to be indifferent, to use Brian Stevenson's phrase. All these years of white neighbors suspecting, accusing, or killing black people occur inside the law, more often than not. Lynching postcards were delivered through the U.S. mail. 911, there's a black man across the street opening his front door. Hurry. Recall mechanisms of my brain bring forward a question and a statement taken from a mural and a billboard. How long is now? There are black people in the future. Tainessi Codes wants us, at the very least, to talk about what reparations could look like. He's in a conversation with historical memory, the archives, the logic of white supremacy, an American public shaped by that logic, a structural reality shaped by that logic, and Mitch McConnell, or what McConnell shaped by that logic stands for. And this is a quote. I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago, for which none of us currently living are responsible, is a good idea." End of quote. McConnell's is a rehearsed and strategic statement. Repetition becomes insistence, morphing into an accepted and acceptable position. Coates is modeling a response to this repetition and what he calls fair weather patriotism. He's pulling us back from the ordinariness of capital capitulation to the built-in violence in white supremacy. Tell me, I don't have a racist bone in my body. Tell me, I don't see color. Tell me, I'm not a racist. I'm just not used to voting for black people. Tell me, I have a black friend. And then take in the voting patterns in the US. Those who voted in 2016 to be represented yet again by this form of violence, the 62% of white men and the 47% of white women, a plurality, how am I to understand them? How am I to interpret their comfort with children sleeping on concrete floors in detention centers dedicated to the suffering unto death of these children? And then take in the accepted norms in the US. Quote, like it or not, these are not our kids. Show them compassion, but it's not like he is doing this to the people of Idaho or Texas. These are people from another country." End of quote. How am I to understand the fluidity with which we continue our days? How to understand all our looking away? Teju Cole writes, there are no refugees, only fellow citizens whose rights we have failed to acknowledge. How is it these children don't end up in comas like their European counterparts, refugees in countries like Sweden? Those children suffered from Gimtran syndrome, also known as resignation syndrome. They gave up on life and the state 
and a nation that had rejected them, they gave up on life that felt like too much. Primo Levi described this category of people in Nazi concentration camps, those known as muscle manna. One hesitates, this is a quote from Levi, one hesitates to call them living. One hesitates to call their death, death, in the face of which they have no fear, as they are too tired to understand, end of quote. This calls me back to ethical loneliness, which Jill Stouffer described as the isolation one feels when one as a violated person or as one member of a persecuted group has been abandoned by humanity or by those who have power over one's life possibilities. To give up feels like a form of protection from life itself. Hands up. Don't shoot. But giving up is not a thing to want. But giving up might be what our lives will look like looking back. Not comas, nor emaciated near death, muscle manner, but indifference and tolerance for the unspeakable under the category of helplessness. I imagine helplessness might itself be a thing to be managed, however. Why aren't old people actively involved in our present American struggle? Have so many become so vulnerable to white dominance that the pathways to imaginary change are wiped out of our brains and our default mode networks are in their lowest level of activity? meaning we can no longer envision a new type of future or even rely on what's happening or really see what's happening in our present. In the liminal space in the train station in Boston Back Bay, a recording reminds me and my fellow travelers, if you see something, say something. But then, as if the automated response suddenly understands to whom it speaks, it adds, seeing something means seeing an action, not a person. Who knew to add that? Who dared to utter it? Because of racism, because of the assumption of a single public, because of white supremacy, because of nationalism, it implies First, monitor yourself. The next time I am waiting for Amtrak there in Back Bay, the second statement in the reminder was gone. Why was it taken away? I sometimes joke that my optimism has been stolen by white supremacy. Don't be burdened by white supremacy, my friend responds. The too-muchness of our present reality sometimes gives rise to humor, but could occasion disassociation, detachment from engagement, a refusal to engage in our democratic practices, given how structural and invasive racism remains. A white supremacist orientation is packaged as universal thinking and objective seeing which insists on the erasure of anyone, my actual presence, my humanity, who disrupts this government, this form of governance. The idea that one can stand apart is a nice fantasy, but we can't afford fantasies. Fantasies cost lives. Universalize whiteness and that racial imaginary lives in every moment. We have to be willing to think about this despite spending most of our days not thinking at all. In most cases, we have already decided about everything and everyone. But real thinking, the affect theorist Lauren Ballant writes, interrupts the flow of consciousness with a new demand for scanning and focus. To be forced into thought is to begin to formulate the event of feeling historical in the present, end of quote. 
She wants us to jam the machinery that makes the ordinary appear as a flow. Even as we exist as people in relation, people across the table from each other, people talking in a car, on a plane, by the water fountain, in detention centers, on the street, in the clinic, at the post office, at the DMV, wherever, one conversation has already occurred between us, between you and me, as our encounter newly unfolds. Default positions and pathways might already mean that what I imagine doesn't matter, given that I'm a black woman. What would white people have to graft onto their fantasy, fantasies so they can treat as real the possibility of true change, true equality? In 2008, in 2012, people of color in the defined categories of blacks, Asians, Hispanics, leaving out Middle Eastern people in the category, and indigenous people to the category of other, managed to elect a black president despite the majority of the white vote going to white candidates. Once the victory occurred, white people claimed it as a break in their racism despite the fact that a white majority did not vote for a black candidate in either election. Suddenly, it was falsely the white's possession and progression. What about Obama? I have been, I have heard again. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> I have heard again and again when I pointed to the continuation of our white supremacist reality in this country. What about him? I've answered back before pulling up the voting percentages I keep on my phone. Reimagining agency is the conversation I want to have. How do all of us believe again in our inalienable rights? Agency is right there, and I am willing it forward. Anchored in unknowing, I yearn to rise out of the restlessness of my own forms of helplessness inside a structure that constricts possibility. Let me ask you, or just tell me why, or better yet, how can we? But who is this we? Is it even possible to form a we? Is it even the question? In pluribus um, umbra might have been the first national mistake. Is there a one that the rest of us should step out of the way of or map ourselves onto? And once that pledge is made, what are we citizens of? We, the people, are citizens of what? I won't say again the what that gives me pause. But I will quote Fred Moten here. The analysis of our murderer and of our murder is so we can see we are not murdered. We survive, and then as we catch a sudden glimpse of ourselves, we shudder for we are shattered, nothing survives. The nothingness we share is all that's real. That's what we come out to show. That showing is or ought to be our constant study. Appropriate this. Going forward, is it possible to live e pluribus unum? As a naturalized citizen, I am as connected to the ones who say, go back to where you came from, or send her back, as I am to the democratic processes that named me an American citizen. And as unknowable as I am to anyone else, I forever remain in relation to everyone else. I am not a part of the one, but I am one. There is no beyond 
of citizenship. A stranger tells me he thought the goal was understanding himself as different from, and then he came to understand his sameness. He came to understand himself to be living also among other humans who are not white, living within a structure set up to disenfranchise those others. Arthur Jaffa said, as a black person, you know whiteness and experience it. How do you contain that and the white people who you know and love? I might extend this to all persons who you know and love, each one, one at a time. Our lives could enact a love of close reading of who we each are, the love of a newly formed, newly conceived one, made up of obscure but sensed and unnamed publics in an as yet unimagined future. What I know is that an incoherent desire for a future other than the one that seems to be forming our days brings me to a seat around any table to lean forward, to hear, to respond, to await response from any other. Tell me something, one thing, the thing. Tell me that thing. Thank you. I'm going to set um, inside that space that Claudia just uh, created for us uh, a scene from the guest book towards the end um, between two characters having a conversation. Uh, Kitty Milton, who is the matriarch of this old money family um, on this island in Maine that she and her husband Ogden have bought. And um, she is talking to Reg Pauling, who is an unexpected guest. He and Len Levy, his best friend, who is the first Jewish man that Ogden has hired into his white shoe firm. This is 1959. Um, and Ogden is very proud of the fact that he has done that. And Len and Reg, um, his best friend, Reg is an African-American writer, have appeared on the dock this morning. This is a summer morning in August of 1959. At the end of the night is a big party to celebrate the engagement of one of the Milton daughters. Um, I'm going to read this scene between the uh, Kitty and Reg, and then go directly into this scene um, at the at the party where Reg is actually um, looking at the kind of performance that he's seeing in front of him. After lunch, Reg had followed the others up the lawn without a clear sense of the plan and continued past the house to a little graveyard on a hill above it. He could hear moss on the piano up at the barn. He thought he heard women's voices through the open windows. Up here, at the center of this compass of sound, he was utterly alone. The most beautiful place on earth, Moss had said to him that night at the five spot. And it was. Reg could see the purity of it, the air and the single trees, the sunlit green and that deep, deep blue. But Jesus, he thought. And that morning he was called into the principal's office and told he was going to Harvard, when Harvard was a word that only meant far away, a word that seemed to stick in the mouth of Principal Evans, like a morsel he couldn't bear to swallow. That morning returned. Reg recalled the vast expanse of the yard and having to cross it by himself without Len. He remembered the days in the classrooms up there when he had to grab his seat with his hands to keep himself from bolting out of the room. No one knew what to do with him sitting there. Classmate, roommate, checkmate. He had watched as Len pushed out of the front door of the house just now and made his way, determined, down to the dock. 
He had seen Mr. Milton turn and catch sight of Len coming through the boathouse and wave as Len walked along to the top of the gangway and down. After a little, the two men left the dock in one of the larger boats, towing a second slowly out into the cove where several boats were on mooring. They worked in tandem, and it occurred to Reg that Len might never ask what he had come to ask. He had had the curious sensation watching his friend on the dock at lunch, expounding. He thought he was watching someone so firmly in charge of his part that everything Len spoke sounded preordained, like lines, lines written by a master. Len had hold of every man's attention on that dock, and more than that, of Mr. Milton's clear admiration. Len was at the top of a game Reg hadn't understood until that moment, a game Len wanted to win. And Ogden Milton was the player Len wanted to be, one of those men who stood in the world without question. You could hear it in his voice, in ease, a comfort, as though every room he walked into were his own. He talked as though he had all the time in the world, when what Mr. Milton had, Reg knew, was the world. Sitting beside her on the dock, however, Reg had felt Mrs. Milton recoil as she listened to Len, had felt the chill quiet pulling itself further into the cold. Though she did not mind him, Reg felt. He wondered why. The sun burned with a bright fervor, dismissing the fog and sharpening the afternoon. He could just make out Mr. Milton and Len on the water. He put his hands in his pockets and started back down the hill. Where are you off to, Mr. Pauling? Mrs. Milton called from the green bench in front of the house. Have a seat, she invited him. He wandered over and sat down on the bench. I'm keeping an eye on Ogden, she nodded toward the dock. And Mr. Levy. Len is good with boats, Reg said. She regarded him, the expression on her face unchanging. Tell me, how did you and Mr. Levy become friends? We've known each other since the third grade in Chicago. Kitty's eye fell on Reg's legs stretched in front of him and crossed tidily at the ankles. It was peculiar, but not uncomfortable, to sit here in silence. It would be uncomfortable, she realized, if anyone else were with them. But this man beside her sat as quietly as she sat. This is what could happen, possibly, she thought. We might talk to each other. If no one was watching, a black man and a white woman could talk, after all. She smiled and returned her gaze down the lawn. There's the heron, she said. Picking its way down through the thin trees, the bird appeared, tall and stiff-legged, on the flat rock by the boathouse, uncovered by the tide. And now it stood, like a grasshopper on two feet, looking in that moment like a sentry or a guard or something martial, at attention, waiting for an invisible sign to move. Reg found himself holding his breath. And then the heron flew, simply lifted its wings, took a stroke, and off it went. Reg followed it far out in the bay where lobstermen crossed slowly, toy boats against the low sky, someone else's world entirely, whose sound came to where he sat next to Kitty, bringing the world out there, beyond this island, with it. Someone once asked if I thought there was a story for each of us, she said. He looked over at her. A single story? She nodded. And what did you say? Reg asked. No, she said. And do you think there is one story now? He said. No, she turned to him. I could never have predicted you, for instance. His rather serious face broke open into a lovely smile and he laughed. She smiled back at him. She nodded and turned her head. So there, she mused. Nothing is ever as difficult as it seems. Or as simple, she added. He didn't reply. 
They sat together like that, the woman who had been tended and combed all her life, who had dived off those rocks into the frigid sea and emerged laughing, lightly rubbing her limbs down with a thick towel, who had accompanied her husband back and forth to Europe after the war, who turned at dinner tables like a smooth beam lighting upon her partner. Here I am, here you are, and the black man, the slight man whom she had liked right away, who sat easily beside her, restfully, his feet up on the bottom rung of the garden bench. She felt the thinking in him. She felt the mind beside her pulling out this thought and that, sifting as he sat silently, and she saw that he had come here without precisely knowing what he had come for, that he stood on the verge of something, and that he was fundamentally, powerfully alone. I could have saved a child from the war, she heard herself say out loud. A Jew. His mother asked if I would keep him during the war. She did not look at him. She could not. She had to finish it now. And I said no. She could feel his stare and did not look. It was possible to say to him, here is what happened, she thought, but impossible, impossible to explain how. It wasn't because he was Jewish, she said. It was because he was alive. Do you see what was unforgivable at the time was that he was alive. Reg sat very still, his hands on the bench. And what happened to him? Yeah. I don't know. I expect I'll never know. She shifted, turning to him. And what is one to do with that? Do, he met her eyes. What is one to do? They looked at each other, and then she looked away, rising from the bench. That man, she exclaimed, persists in doing business. Jesus. Reg exhaled as Mrs. Milton walked away down the hill toward Len and Mr. Milton. Jesus Christ. And then later, at the party, the men are all on their feet and they're about to sing a, a song. They're all singers from college. And um, the men in the shoe draw close tipping toward one another, waiting for the pitch pipe to start them off, their eyes on him. The pitch pipe raises his hand and opens his mouth, and in a light, irrepressible tenor, he leads the men singing forward into the song. I'll be ready when you are. And Ogden, Fenno, Dickey, Moss, all of the men went right along beside him, sending the notes of the song into the air. You can count on me as ready to go. And then Moss stepped forward out of the shoe and toward the guests, swinging into the solo with the light step of a dancer. The words less the enticement than the way the tune <coughs> climbed up the scale and swung out over the second line, the men behind him growing softer, letting Moss soar so everyone could hear, there on the rocks, Moss's single treble raised to the sky. Reg watched the glow on Moss's face as he sang. How music filled him. How Moss believed with all the breath in him in every note he sang, note by note, as if the world could be built on air and sound. As if the problems of the world might be solved by men like these, ranged in a tight circle leaning into the notes sung together, swelling upward into a twilight sky. He knew that this was Moss's dream. And he remembered that night long ago when he'd stumbled on Moss singing just such a song, sending note after note into the air and believing that was enough. And yet Reg's life, Reg's parents' life, were nowhere in these notes, not even buried. Here on this island in the middle of the, of the Atlantic, 
Reg was surrounded by the best and the brightest, the men who ran and would run this country and who would never lay a hand on him, but who could change the laws if they could see. And they wouldn't. Reg saw the limit fully in this singing. Ma sang as if the gates of the world could open with him, believing with all his heart that they could. But here on the island, the care with which Reg was being handled, the pronounced attention was merely the opposite face of the face that gave the hard stare or the push between the ribs or the whip. Both faces turned to the black man as though to a wall that had to be climbed or knocked down and always with the infinitesimal moment of wariness that slid immediately into anger or polite regard, as if to say, ah, you again. This was what he wanted to rip into. This was why Reg thought he'd come, why he'd made this trip over in a lobster boat in part for this, to hear what always went unvoiced and to make Moss see that, to make Moss see. But watching Moss singing, the vast uselessness of what he was after caught Reg there around the fire. Seeing was not enough. Speaking was not enough. Doing even was not enough. He could tear it down for Moss and for Len, he thought, and there'd be satisfaction in it, but little joy. Joy. The word floated up as Mrs. Milton caught, caught his eye. Reg held her gaze a moment, and she nodded at him and looked away. He shuddered. She was, perhaps, the worst of them all. <laughs> So we have these two rich texts on the table, um, and I want to open it up um, for questions from the audience. Um, um, and yeah, I don't know if I necessarily want to sort of say more than that, but um, given the themes that you guys have opened up of loneliness and uh, silence um, and possibility and the limits thereof, uh, there's plenty on the table. So oh, I don't know, is someone going around with a microphone? Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, any responses? No? <gasps> None at all? Yeah, okay. Uh, th <clears throat> thanks so much for sharing those. Uh, Incredible text, uh, really moving. And I was wondering um, something that really caught my ear in Claudia Rankin's text was her her settling around indifference. And I was wondering if I could invite you both to say a little bit more about the complexities of that and and how you understand that indifference can be remobilized. <laughs> well, I, um, for me, at the core of my um, argument with white America, beyond the violence that's just bred into white supremacy, is the ability to live one's life holding that violence. Um, and so to me that, you know, obviously one wants change, but I'm also interested in what is that human condition? I mean, it, it, in a way, it's about the banality of indifference in a way. You know, it's like, how is it that we are able to continue in our day-to-day -day lives when in this very country, um, in this very city, people are allowed to live in ways 
that limit their ability to learn. And, and, and this is, I say white America because structurally, I think it's a part of the problem of how we began. But I also, I'm asking that question of myself. And I think the writing, in a sense, is a way of engaging what is it about our human condition that allows us to feel okay. I mean, for white people, it's like, why is it okay for black people to be shot and killed in the street by police and the police, for example, um, to get off? And that is okay. With, and, but if it's a white person, that's not okay. So those, you know, I, I don't want to get into all of that because you all know all about that. Everybody talks about it. Um, but, you know, but nobody just, like, pushes at that. Like, basically, what we're talking about is a ground level indifference. So that I'm, I'm sort of trying to, to hold that as part of who I am. I think, too, the, um, you know, what are the mechanisms of indifference? How, how do we perpetuate indifference? And, and, you know, the two sort of sections that I was reading show, um, in some senses, the um, the way in which, for example, Kitty, the white character, thinks she is saying something that and thinks that she is, in fact, in, in fact sort of um, exhibiting a connection, making a connection. And, in fact, um, what I'm really hoping to do in this, uh, in this novel is look at, at the ways in which the, the profound disconnect between what the white characters imagine they are saying and what they are saying, and the ways in which silences and the, the unsaid perpetuate um, this kind of uh, this sort of loop of um, uninterrupted, this is how it was, this is how we do things on the island. And that um, Reg's uh, sort of coming on and interrupting and, and seeing um, them is a way to have uh, the text itself um, pulling back to show the kind of um, the flip flops of the, of how indifference gets gets passed on, um, and I think that the 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 idea of um, the way in which we uh, the, a white America can look away, like what are the what are the ways that happens, and and when we were talking about history and how we. Um, imagine history. The idea that a history is past, as you, you know, when you were uh, mentioning the Mitch McConnell in there, that um, that it seems more and more that if we can show how the past is present all all the time, that, and certainly it seems like we're in a moment right now where there is a, a way in which that's everywhere, that, that notion that um, the past is present, that there's a through line. How long is now? Now is then and and now and and so that the indifference is um, made more and more impossible if you start to see that in fact we are who we are now is who we were you know, then. Oh, thank you all. Um, is this working? Yeah. Yes. I think part of the problem about indifference is the whitewashing of history. Um, I'm not talking about the present, but the myth of, um, I'll start with white people's indifference to people of color, um, is because the winners wrote the history and don't account for the rebellious, subversive <coughs> white people who fought back against white supremacy. I, I'm thinking of one particular story. Um, in the women's suffrage movement, there were two women, both Jewish, I want to say, Jewish socialists, who objected to the all-white meetings and were, um, of course, denied. But nobody, I mean, this is an arcane fact that I have uncovered in the archives, but it stands to me for a whole hidden history that speaks against indifference and it's hard to find, but it's there. And I think part of, at least I consider my job to be uncovering things like that. So since we're talking about history, 
I'm thinking the things we know are so shaped by a mainstream white Christian um, world about our own history, and they're not full. Um, I just want to pick up on uh, this question of indifference and maybe push a little bit on the idea, um, the idea, uh, are we talking about um, indifference or silence um, or fatigue? Right? Um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, so I, I'm wondering if when we're talking about whites or belief in the order of things, Right. Also, there's that. Right. There's not. You know, this is not always. There's not always a mistake. Right. Um, so, um, I wonder, in terms of um, telling these stories, um, what is this American struggle? Right. Telling these stories, um, if perhaps we are uh, being imprecise or letting um, ourselves or white supremacy off too easily by talking only of indifference. Right. Uh, but I don't know what you what you all think. But I, don't, I mean, to talk about indifference is to talk about a day to day, a kind of um, quotidian tolerance for the violence. So it's not letting one off in terms of what the reality of the violence is. We know that exists. We know it's built into our structural day to day. It's what allows for the kind of wealth that some people have and other people, you know, all of that. We know that, so we don't need to go there. But I do think we're in a moment where um, it's at least necessary for me to think about how, how can we reroute this thing that seems to be more and more bloody as the days go by. Um, and and in order to do that, one has to recognize one's own um, stasis, immobility. And, and, and it's true. It's a kind of kind way to call it indifference. Um, it could be intentional disregard, mm -hmm. um, given that um, change would necessitate the loss of certain things for certain people. And that cannot happen. Um, so, so I agree with you that it, there is a sense that perhaps the term has a kind of benevolence in it that should not be there. But, um, but I think um, the rhetoric is allows for the ordinary person, and I that would be me, um, to step through a door that I know. Mm -hmm. Um, that isn't um, debilitating in terms of one's sense of access to power, for example. Like, do I not have any power? So is that why I'm indifferent? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I, do you see what I mean? I, I think that the, the use of the term is not in any way mitigating the kind of violence we know exists. Right. And that we are party to and culpable for. And may experience. Mm -hmm. Or may experience. And I guess I meant with fatigue, this is the other thing, in, in the other side of indifference or the exception of the order of things might also be an exhaustion, right? And, and not just an exhaustion with the, I like the way you said it all, you again, right? Like with the question of race, but a, a literal exhaustion in our, um, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives. Like to be an ordinary person means to sort of be behind the eight ball often, right? Like um, trying to, to make the next meeting, trying to pay the next bill, trying to, right? Like, so I just wanted to bring those questions also um, of, I don't know, political economy, economy maybe into the mix um, when we're talking about agency and thinking about agency. So now I think we um, want to, I just want to sort of push forward to a, a new section. Can I say just, I'm sorry. Sure, yeah. But can I, just what you just said just made me think of something because you were looking at Sarah and I was wondering if you meant that all three of us are the same person. No. In our, 
<laughs> no, I do not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, I, I, you know, our economic status between, even between just you and me, are very different in terms of generational wealth, mm-hmm. in terms of what is capable for you versus what is capable for me, just in the street. Mm-hmm. Sure. So that idea of exhaustion plays itself out very different on this side of the, the, the line. Yeah, and it, I mean, it also, <coughs> just in terms of indifference, like it's also incredibly, it's going to be singular depending on my indifference, your indifference. I mean, no. I, I keep wondering, like, what, indif- what are we talking about? Yeah. What is in, what is Difference to what? How? Well, my use of it has really to do with the tolerance for okay, yeah, for the tolerance for violence for violence in 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 these United States. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I, I want to ask another question that has to do with these United States, actually. Um, and um, one thing that I noticed in, in our conversation previous to to this event, um, we were thinking about. Um, American history, imagination, and race. Um, one of the words um, that kept kind of passing in the emails was this word crucible, right? The crucible of um, race and history in this moment. Um, and um, so I, I actually sort of looked up all the work, the keywords in this, this uh, you know, history, memory, race, imagination, imaginary. And this word crucible that we kept talking about, what is the crucible of race in American history in this moment? Um, and when I looked up the word crucible, uh, because I thought, you know, it's, I, I remember it from school, right? Like the crucible, the play, right? Like somebody gets crushed under some rocks. It's terrible, right? Like, um, but but in looking, looking at the definition, here's what I found, okay? So um, a crucible is a literal container in which metals are mixed and melted, right? It's a literal container in which metals are mixed and melted, which means that a crucible is literally a melting pot. So um, I thought, um, how, how apt um, and bizarre. Uh, and, and I wonder, you know, this idea, this image of a melting pot is supposed to be this benign, cliche, passe image, right? Like, you know, um, the American experience, this is a melting pot, right? Um, but if you kind of think about it literally, if we think about the crucible of race in American history, you, you think, well, yes, of course, this melting pot, this place where all these people are mixing, um, actually is a really excruciating experience, which seems to just go on and on, right? The metals don't seem to be mixing. Um, and so, I guess the question that I wanted to sort of put to you, does this make sense? You're mm-hmm. like, um, um, so the question I kind of want to put to you is, do you think that, and this is a kind of on the riff of e pluribus unum, right? Do you think that this, um, this mixing of metals, right, this crucible, this container that we're in, um, do you think that we will end up with a mixed metal anytime soon? Um, or will we just keep cooking in this pot? And and what and what would have to um, what would have to what would we have to understand, right, in order for the process to happen, right? What would we have to say? How would we have to speak to each other, right? Um, what would we have to do? How do we have to understand agency in order for this pot to stop melting? But, I mean, what you're doing is you know sort of nudging us towards thinking about um, the imagination. Like, what, what yes. is it that opens up history? And I just, I, I, um, the two epigraphs for this book are James Baldwin's People Are Trapped in History and History is Trapped in Them. And then Virginia Woolf's, and that was 1953, that's from Stranger in a Village. And then Virginia Woolf's, which I, I have to, because I always hear it with this very um, long-nosed British accent, Surely it is time that someone invented a new plot. Yes. And in many ways, this, this question that you're asking, yeah. and, you know, the, the, I mean, a crucible is also the thing that is um, where one metal is supposed to transform into yes. another. So it's, supposed to, it's an alchemy. Mm. But um, the, 
is it possible to to you know set those two set Wolf and Baldwin together? Is it if if people are trapped in history, and that begs the question, um, you know, which history? When we talk about American history again, in terms of um, the history that's inside me, what I you know what I imagine American history to be, um, what Claudia does, what Diva does, like what are the histories that are that we carry forward um, inside us? And how does each of that? How do each of those set the bars of the trap? Like, what? What are? How do we even come to see those the bars of that trap? If if we are trapped in history, um, is it possible to invent a new plot, or is it that part of what um, you know we're doing tonight and the, and the terrain that we're in is the imagination? Is there a way to just set the imagination that part of the 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 hope is to, as you talk more and more, you begin to imagine a door through to, you know, not a window, not a mirror, but a door, like something that then pushes you past where you had thought you could go. So the, the ways in which um, the trap, um, how, how you both um, spring the trap by seeing the trap, you know, and, and the history. I just want to add that, you know, um, Wolf said that, but then she also said things like the fat Jew in yeah. Paris referring yeah. yes. to, so her notion yeah. of a changed plot was a plot that included her mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and only her mm -hmm. just just <laughs> but, the, but even you know the word plot, we were you know, we talked about this, that the plot is a structure that is, you know, it's a container. Mm -hmm. It's also something that's created, that's, you know, mm -hmm. that binds. And, and so the notion of... But I just, I, I just mean to put her up against Baldwin as having an intentionality that seems equal to me is false, given her own anti-Semitism and her own, right. you know. But that's another day. <laughs> But what about this this issue of um, so the way that you ended the piece that you read right tell me the thing tell me that thing um, and this notion of um, an alchemy right that would have to take place an alchemy that would have to take place with people like Wolf and Baldwin who are unequal in their intentionality and their understanding and their vision and their way of seeing like this to me this to me <coughs> seems the question right um and it's not a quick it doesn't seem the question of like a um you know it's not interpersonal relationships it's not the people you love or you hang out with or whatever like if there is the thing right that can spark the transformation the alchemy that could give us a new plot a way out of the melting, right, and into uh, a new way of being. Like, what would that thing be, right? Can we imagine it? Um, so, uh, well, well I, um, who who won the Nobel yesterday? Peter Hanke. Yeah. The scientist. No. Oh no, the scientist. Yeah. The the, the ninety eight year old chemist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I forgot. The, the ninety eight year old chemist. chemist. Yeah. <laughs> the three chemists. You, you mean the lithium battery? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. I mean, I think, you know, we were talking about this earlier because the idea that the fact that everyone has a telephone right now and that the ability yeah. to record the moment change mainstream media, mm -hmm. that, that the biggest change for me has been that we no longer have a room full of white men telling us what is news. We have people saying the killing of Michael Brown is news. The shooting here is news. The death there is news. And that has shifted what mainstream media looks like. And, I, and, and that came from the ground up because of, te of a technological advance. And so I, I, I do think that there are ways in which shifts are happening. Arab Spring was also organized 
because people suddenly had contact with each other and were able to galvanize and, and, and come together. What is interesting in the United States for me is we have shown again and again that we have the ability to come to, look at all those white women who showed up. In the Women's March? In the Women's March. Mm -hmm. So they can do it when they want. That they have not done it for the killing of Trayvon Martin, for the killing of Michael Brown, that is intention. Mm -hmm. That is conscious. That speaks to the rest of us because they can do it when they want. So that, you know, so we have had movement that allows for collective action Absolutely. and agency when people want it. The question is, what is wanted and what is not wanted? And in a way, you know, it would be interesting if people would just say, we don't give a shit about black people. We will come together for the things that matter to us, like Virginia Woolf. And we will not for the things and the people who do not matter. And that is what we see in 2019, and that is what we saw in 1860 and in 1719, and, you know, and probably, I hate to say it, in 2020 and in, 20, you know? Right, but then the question is, why is the myth overlaid then, right? Why is that a story that, that, that people refuse to tell, even though we have this evidentiary? I'm not refusing um, to tell her. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, that is true. No, but I, I, I mean... Um... And Sarah's telling it. I mean, we're beginning... I think people are now starting to tell it. Yes. 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 So, as a person, and I know I'm supposed to move on, Michael. Oh, yeah, the time. Don't get mad. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I think as a person who studies social movements and studies political discourse... Um, and studies persuasion, um, a key aspect of American discourse is always the reality of this story that actually we don't care about some people, right? Evidently, we don't care about black people. We don't care about poor people. We don't care about much about women. Even those million women who showed up, what, what happened, right? What changed, right? Um, from their appearance there, me right? Too. Um, yeah, me too. Is a movement, and movements matter, right? And they should. But I'm, but I'm saying sort of like direct. So there are all these groups um, who organize, and that organizing is important, and it shifts our frame of reference. It shifts our conversation. It shifts what's politically possible. But in American discourse, there is always overlaid this myth that absolutely, it's actually we care about everyone. It's too bad that you're dying the way you are. But actually, we, we have to say we care about everyone. So I wonder, if, I wonder if being able to have this frank conversation, right, for people who don't care, maybe, the, maybe that is happening right now. Maybe that's part of what's riven, right, the country, right, is that finally there are, you know, people who are saying, actually, we don't care. Actually, it's okay if we rip your children away, and it's fine if you die, right? Um, but anyway, so just to put that all out there, now it's time for questions. Um, <laughs> okay. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here again. Um, I'm a graduate student at Columbia University. I'm studying the relationship between the individual citizen body and the collective body politic. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on why it's important to understand that relationship in terms of understanding the American imaginary. Good. <laughs> um, why, is it, why is it important to understand citizenship and well, I think, well, it goes back to what Deepa was saying. The, you know, we, we have been fed the sort of bullshit that there is one public um, rather than 
the fact that there are many publics. Some of them served um, at the benefit of others. Um, and that citizenship creates a kind of equality among us that we all have access without talking about the importance, importance to the system of voter suppression, of how mass incarceration works to limit voting rights, and how corrupt mass incarceration is and how targeted it is to certain communities in order not to allow those votes to happen. You know, so the whole, the whole system is, is, and you know, the electoral college is another issue. If you don't like how it works, then somebody else will come in and fix it. You know, so it, it's, um, it's the system we have. And, um, you know, the people I am really interested in right now, like Stacey Abrams is somebody, the work that she is doing now in terms of trying to even the playing field for people to just have access to voting, it's not sexy, but it is crucial if we are to maintain this notion of citizenship as the first gate to representation, you know? And, um, and I don't think we can lose that because it is the connective tissue between us. You can't just, you know, throw it away. We are, you know, we are citizens of this country. And, you know, I am a naturalite. Everybody here on some, in some way is an immigrant. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that I love doing, because I am a very boring person, is tracking immigration laws through the centuries. You know, because then you can sort of see, first it's, you know, um, Anglo-Saxon white men. And then if you just keep tracking them coming forward, it really is a question of who gets pushed out, who gets pushed out, who gets pushed out. You can't be a citizen. You can't be a citizen. You're Asian. You can't be a citizen. You're, you know? And, and so this idea that those Anglo-Saxon, those people in Sarah's book, white men, own the land, own the voting rights, own that has never, the perception of that has not changed. Look at who's in Congress. I mean, I think, too, that this, um, it sounds like what you're asking is, uh, how is it that each of us um, can come to a, you know, some sort of uh, reckoning or um, awareness of our own position in history as citizens, and then in what relation <coughs> does that individual um, place bear to the larger collective and the representation of it. <coughs> so, but it's also true that the body politic contains people who are not citizens, right? Um, and that matters as well, right? They're still members of the polity. How do we deal with that? <coughs> yes. <coughs> Hi, my name is Antoinette. I'm also a Columbia student, <laughs> um, but MFA poetry. And um, I think of the American origin story is, is one that is imagination in and of itself. <coughs> and so part of the creation of, of this imagination is that America is this ecosystem and um, this invasive species of white supremacy is at the root of the design of this ecosystem. And so how, how does one then have an ecosystem that, that works, um, especially with this idea of an invasive <coughs> species of white supremacy? And, and when you think out in nature, like 
ecosystems don't tend to survive those things. I have a really relevant story. Go okay. for it. <laughs> Weirdly, um, now that, that you mentioned it, um, I was just reading randomly about tortoises, um, the giant tortoises on the Galapagos Island and how they have been endangered. And the reason that they became endangered was because um, uh, a ship, colonial ship, right, was sailing by, docked not for very long, just for a little while, but on board the ship were rats. And the rats were invasive. And the rats got onto the island and ate all the turtle eggs causing this ecosystem to be totally destabilized, right? Um, for hundreds, or sorry, not for hundreds of years, but for um, many decades. But there were conservation efforts, and now the tortoise population is coming back. And they tried for a long, long time to um, kind of raise the turtles in uh, like a different place, like take the eggs and then bring them back when the turtles were mature, and nothing happened until in 2012 they decided to kill the rats. <laughs> and now the turtles are fine. They're doing great. <laughs> so make of that what you will. I do not endorse this message. <laughs> I mean, but if we think of the rat as white supremacy, right, um, then, then what do you do to kill that, that rat, mm -hmm. right? How do you have a new founding myth? You guys are writers of stories. <laughs> <laughs> Make something. <laughs> well, well that, yeah, go on. I mean, I think for one thing, the part of... Um, you know, again, in terms of imagining and moving past, um, white supremacy is one of those terms that seems to me to mm -hmm. be uh, incredibly problematic, especially for the collective white imagination, because I think um, there is still, and this is part of the sort of origin myth and the ways in which white supremacy is talked about, it's still that sense that it is, um, you know, not me, because I'm not, you know, right. KKK. And to um, reimagine, I mean, I love your, uh, your sort of image of an ecosystem, to actually, to, like, to reimagine and retrain, and this is one of those examples I'm talking about where the imagination opens a door and you walk through it. If we, as, as in the sort of white imagination, if you um, see white supremacy as just the system we're all in, and that, you know, yeah. As we, especially in the last, um, you know, five years, there's, it seems to be there's a huge um, kind of sea change going on in the kind of history uh, or the reframing of the history of, of this origin myth that freedom and slavery are coterminous in this country. And it's, you know, from Jill Lepore to Eric Foner to the 1619 Project, that reframing um, so that slavery is absolutely at the root. And in that case, then, that's the system that our, our laws have continued. And you, know, you have practical slavery going on at the same time as you have this ideation of freedom. So those two things, and the paradox between those two things, is the origin myth. So how we do the sort of flip-flops to avoid that, you know, the, the, you know that, that, that surely that's not true. Because in fact, in that implicates, that is the ecosystem that those two things, you know, you have rats and tortoises together. I'm not sure this is going to go with that. <laughs> but so killing the rats isn't the, isn't the, the, you know, the answer. The answer is this, is, this is who we are. This is, like, tell me that thing. This is the thing. Can we say that thing? Could we keep saying that thing and keep looking at that thing? Mm -hmm. That, that, that um, if you have freedom and slavery as the actual foundation myth, you know, in Virginia, in 1619, in July, the first 20 Burgesses, the first self-governing body, were um, elected. And a month later, the first Afri 20 African slaves were brought in. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, a kind of allegory from Nathaniel Hawthorne. There it is. It, it's, it couldn't be more um, evidentiary, but also uh, explicit. So I think that, um, so. And if we just hop on to 2018 
the FBI report that came out said no um, people of color who've been killed um, in the last year were killed by in in hate crimes were killed by jihadists. There killed no, by what? Killed by who? Jihadists. There were no. Oh, no jihadists. There were none. Zero. Mm -hmm. They were all white supremacists. They were from white supremacist groups. Fifty. There was an increase in, by fifty percent of white supremacy groups in the last three years. Fifty percent. Um, so it's true that people think oh, white supremacy equals KKK, but it doesn't. White supremacy equals the American system. Exactly. It, it's yeah. systemic. When you had in, in um, the end of the Civil War, you had the formation of the KKK, but they didn't have to stay active because the black codes were built into the laws on state level from state to state. So their agenda became the state agenda. It's one and the same thing. So that myth, that, I think if we just even started, you know, Baldwin says, if we just change one word in the sentence, and if the sentence that says that the KKK and the white supremacists are one thing, if that got changed, because the white, white supremacy is this. This is what it looks like. We are in the system of it. Basically, it says that white people are the supreme people. Are the Period. people. Are mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. Are the people. But since they're not the people, I'm going to call them the supreme people. <laughs> But that, it does say that white people are the people. So, I, you know, that would be a place to begin in terms of shifting the narrative. Um, so I have to open it up for questions and we're going to move on. But I just want to say that something interesting has happened um, in the last several years. Um, and this is in terms of public opinion. And this is actually public opinion among white people. Um, which is that, uh, and it's sort of started happening uh, not during the Obama years, by the way, but it started happening around the um, ascendance, the peak part of demonstrations of the movement with black lives and accelerated um, uh, exponentially after uh, the election of Trump, is that white people who identify themselves as liberals are Democrats, for the first time, um, have started to identify structural racism at rates that almost equal those of black Americans for the first time but only white people who identify themselves as Democrats or liberals. Now, this is a big shift because there was never a diff there had not been before, and I mean before 2015, a difference in terms of white opinion about the reality of structural racism, right, um, before this moment. Um, and so that's something that's, now, on the other side, right, uh, people who identify themselves as conservative and who um, score high on racial resentment have become even more strident, right, in terms of their rejection of the idea that there's um, anything but the deficiency of people of color at the root of, of uh, racial problems in the U.S. So that's just a little bit of data for you um, as we move into the sort of question section. Um, okay, with all this on the table, how can we forward? I just want to make sure we get a Good cross section of folks. Yes. Thank you all so much. Uh, so, this has started me thinking about um, history, American history, and commitment to that history and white supremacy's role or its, its, its reason for being to maintain a certain kind of history. And as far as imagination, I would love to read a broader story, a, 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 a fiction, where all history in this country is equal. Well, it's equally <coughs> told. It has equal weight. It's inclusive. I think the undoing of our commitment to a very thin history is 
what what continues to perpetuate and feel threatening to people who uh, are holding on to this very thin, very pale version of American history. And I know there's, I know that systemically there's been lots of effort in continuing to whitewash American history. But I think there's something there about broadening what American history is uh, that can help to undo, in some ways, some thinking for some people. Because I think some people are certainly committed to the way that they think. But I, it could be because they don't know the whole story. Mm -hmm. so, just some thoughts about history and imagination in this country. Can I say, so um, just thinking about uh, work that is interrogating, you know, um, the sort of uh, the stance that each of us may have towards, you know, who we are in, in history. And um, we were talking earlier about reparative writing, writing or art that is in some way um, uh, addressing or, or trying to come close to what you're talking about. I'm, I don't know how many of you have seen the uh, the play Fairview, but um, by Jackie Sybil's Drury. But um, I just I was I live in D.C. I just saw it, and one of the um, things that happens in in the play is that there is a physical um, there's a physical separation of the audience between white and black, and but most importantly, there the it ends with the um, a, a young black woman who is is asking, would it be possible for me to ask you, you white people, to come up here, and 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 then going on, would it be possible? Could I imagine a world? Could I imagine a world in which I were not being seen by you? Could I imagine? what it might be like. And she comes down and stands, you know, um, in the audience. The, uh, she's asked the white people in the audience to come up here and the black people to stay seated. And that physical, um, and it's incredible, you know, it, it, it generates all kinds of controversy in terms of what is being asked of each of us. But somehow that, the kind of art that, interrupt, that physically brings onto the surface who we are in the space, and, and I would say, you know, who, who we are in the history that we keep telling and we keep passing on, either in silence or in myth. And, but it's, it's these moments, these acts of, um, that, that sort of physically remind us, oh, this, I am this white person in the audience and I am this white person on the stage, and the, the, the through line between what that means vis-a-vis -vis history is what it seems to me unbelievable about that about that play. And Stevenson's memorial is the same kind. Of, he's like physically rendering, um, you know, making it impossible not to see both the memorial for the for the um, lynched, but also that brilliant um, the the columns that he's left on the side for every uh, county to to take back with them. And and so the notion of who are you now and who were you? They're creating these through lines that make it impossible to just carry on. You see, I mean, so I think there's, there's a lot um, of work going on in that vein. Do you want to respond? Should I take another question? Well, I, um, that sense of work that interrupts or takes on the, uh, the notion of um, rerouting. As you were speaking, I was thinking about, I, I know you all um, got copies of the white card. And working on the white card was an interesting moment for me, because the white card is a, is a play where um, the white people are being interrogated. People like to say it's satire, but in many ways, it's just stuff that has happened. You know, it's, it it's, could be satire, but it could also just be stuff that has happened. And in the rehearsal for the play, it was 
white man actors would say things like, not our final cast, but people who came. Um, <laughs> not the ones we have. Uh, um, you know, they would say, this, this is unfair to white people. You don't like white people. Um, and basically what they were saying, what I was hearing as a playwright was, this narrative has never been given to us. Mm. And you can't make me imagine myself into it. Mm -hmm. And so we went through a lot of actors. <laughs> <laughs> because the resistance mm -hmm. was so great. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it wasn't just the white actors, the black. We needed a black female. And many of the, the young black females said things like, I don't understand why she, why this black character would stay in a room with white people. Like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or they would shout the lines, like everything was an argument. And, and, and that was surprising to me, mm. that these black women didn't know that over the course of a lifetime, you're going to end up in rooms with white people. Hello. <laughs> <coughs> and so we also lost some black female um, actresses, actors. So that sense that there are certain narratives that just are not even possible mm -hmm. to the imagination of people who are actors, whose role it is, job it is, to put themselves in an imaginary place. Yes. And they couldn't do it mm -hmm. because of this issue of likability for white people. Mm -hmm. Like, why do people have to believe that black people like them before they'll play along? Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we are <laughs> here. We are right. Okay. So um, glad that settled. <laughs> we're 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 at this moment. I know we have to finish. Time. So um, so so the one thing, what this story brought up for me though, and that I want to put out there is, um, you know, uh, in uh, Du Bois writes um, at uh, in Souls of Black Folk. Um, where he's sort of like coming to the point of, of saying what, um, what he's writing about. Um, he has this moment where he says, I'm in these room with these white people, right? And they're always like, oh, Mr. Du Bois, you're like one of these smart Negroes, you know? And, um, and they're, all, they're kind of asking him, you know, they want to ask him this question that he phrases, um, you know, ends up boiling down to be, what does it feel like to be a problem, right? And indeed, that's the problem of the color line. The problem of the color line in this construction and at the beginning of the 20th century, according to, to Du Bois, right, um, is this, what does it feel like to be a problem um, addressed to black people, right, to people of color? So I wonder if, in order to change this narrative, in order to make it imaginable that we can have a new plot, mm -hmm. that that's a question that has to be put to white people. Mm -hmm. What does it feel like to be a problem? That's it. Thank you, everyone.